So I think if I were to ask you, about 90% of you would admit to having some kind of major failure in your lives at some point. And the other 10%, well, it's hard to admit failure. It's embarrassing. It's painful. But if we fail to uh, think about, in a mindful way, our failures, we fail to learn from them. As we heard from the last speaker, you can't grow that way. And it, it uh, empowers you, if you think about how you failed, to actually weather future storms. And I do want to talk about weather. So let's look at this. Uh, weather has a certain majesty and power about it. It captures your attention. And so imagine, if you will, you're across the field from this F5 tornado. It's running towards you. It's screeching like a freight train. It's moving at 60 miles an hour. And it's packing winds that are three times the speed of the most powerful hurricane. You're not going to be daydreaming about your next vacation. So it's really no accident when I ask my students when they first became interested in meteorology and how that came about, they say it was often an event like this that affected people they know or themselves, their community, and it was the time they were this high, four years old. But it's one thing to have an interest in something and another to make a professional career out of it. My own path was different in that respect. I had no interest whatsoever in the weather growing up, except insofar as there was a big snowstorm and it canceled school. And then it was both interesting and fun, so that was great. <laughs> but that changed when I got to high school and I read a book about meteorology and I realized it was an interesting blend of physics, math, engineering, and a little bit of art even thrown into it. And so I thought that would be something that would be worth studying, and so I continued looking at it and the more I worked with it, the more interested I became. And so I came full around to exactly where my students were when they were this high. And that happened over a period of years. So that's known as the wisdom of babes, that you learn something when you're that small. Um, and so the idea of uh, working with weather is something that I think our students coming into our programs have always had in mind. But there was no opportunity for them really to do this. And at the same time, as I worked with our students, I learned that they, many of them, had to work outside jobs to make ends meet. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we can combine that passion they have for weather with a paying job that allows them really to build up their skills in their profession? And it was at that point that the idea of innovative weather, the nonprofit within the nonprofit at UW-Milwaukee, was born. But it's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to make something out of it. And um, the problem is how do you get people to pay for a service like this? So you might think, why would anybody pay for the weather? It's freely available. You can find it anywhere. But in fact, 40% of the US economy is weather dependent. There's billions of dollars that are at stake because of weather. And there are many companies that are very interested in sophisticated guidance in terms of managing weather risk. An example is in this image. So here we have some very uh, graphic electrical display from a thunderstorm. And you may or may not be able to see in this image the power lines that are out in the front. But electrical activity has a really damaging effect on power systems. And so energy companies are very interested in getting help to manage those kinds of situations. So as I thought about this more, and how to build a program like this, I realized that there were a whole set of value questions. First of all, making it valuable to the students, making it of value to the university as part of the larger set of programs that we have, but also demonstrating value to our community partners. And it turned out that there were some larger issues at play here as well. Uh, there were some very key supporters initially. Uh, in particular, the dean of my college got the idea right away and thought it was a good thing to pursue. But there were many other people at the university who told me why this could not, should not, and would not be done. So I thought about that for a minute, and I decided to ignore them. <laughs> and the reason I did that is partly because of failure. Failure can help you weather future storms, and we've all had failures, so I'll tell you about one of mine that was uh, actually instrumental in my meteorology career. So I'd always been a good student, and I entered college with the idea of studying meteorology, which was in my program, physics-based. And so in my very first semester at college, I was in my very first physics class, and I was doing well. I went into the final exam with an A average, 
But this was high stakes testing. The final exam, a three hour endur endurance ordeal, was 80% of your final grade. So whatever happened in those next three hours was gonna tell the story. So I was a little bit anxious. And then I sat down, I got that exam paper, and I was in full panic. And so I spent the next three hours scribbling answers, erasing answers, scribbling more answers, erasing more answers. And at the end, I handed in my eraser-soaked paper with obviously very little effect. I did not do well in that class, as you can imagine. And so I thought about that, and I said, well, meteorology is largely physics. If I can't do physics, I can't do meteorology. But then I took a deep breath, and I thought about what actually happened. What happened through the course of the semester, and what happened in that three-hour window that caused me to mess up so badly? And I realized there were some things that I could do differently that would help me. And as it happened, so I decided I'll give myself a break. I'll give myself a chance to do this one more time, and we'll see what happens. So I had another physics course the very next semester. In fact, it was the advanced version of the same one I just failed. So that's a pretty good test. And I implemented my plan, and it worked beautifully. I, I got through the semester, did very well. And so I learned from that previous failure how to manage a situation like that. I was still nervous going into the exam, but I was able to do it. So I decided to ignore the advice that I was be, being given to not do this at UWM. Now, I realized very quickly one of the things I would need is help. I'm a, a full, fully engaged professor, ha heavily engaged in research, a lot of administrative activities. There's no way that I could oversee a 24-7 weather forecast agency on a daily basis while doing all of these other things. So I would need somebody who could actually manage that part of the operation. So the key was to find somebody like that. And this is where connections are really instrumental. And they're the kinds of things that you don't necessarily imagine when they're happening. They happen later on. And the connection was a former student of mine who'd worked as an undergraduate researcher for a semester for me and enjoyed the experience, went on to do professional forecasting, and had just moved back into the community. And I pitched this idea to him, and he got it immediately. He understood the vision. He wanted to be part of it. And so he set forth to actually build this program. First thing we needed was a place to put it. Uh, if you know UWM at all, you know that space is extremely cramped. In the time that we, we built this program, it was even more the case. Uh, but we were finally able to find a single office that was filled with junk at the side of the campus. And we were told, if we cleaned it out, it was ours. So we did clean it out. In fact, we even repurposed the closet to be an audio booth. So if you listen to WWM Innovative Weather Forecast, that's where it's coming from. We also put in some tables and some computer equipment and started the progress of the, of the program. We talked to some potential clients. We got a few people on board. And within a relatively short time, we were earning enough income to be able to afford better furniture and better computers still in the same space. But this is largely a testament to the passion that the students had. They got the idea immediately. As soon as this opportunity was there, they were ready to seize it and run with it. We also uh, expanded our reach from the initial energy companies that we talked to to include clients in communication, in entertainment, in transportation, and academic institutions, just to name a few. So what Innovative Weather does, how is this different? It's really about customization and service. Uh, many weather companies that are out there, what they do is they have a shelf of products, shelf A, shelf B, and if you're a potential client, you have to look on those two shelves and decide which one you can jury rig to work your, your uh, program best. And we turn that around and we say, okay, if you were to design a weather decision support service from the ground up, what would it look like? And that's what we build. And that's the reason it's focused on service, specifically risk assessment, for those clients and communicating in a very clear way what those risks are so that they can actually take action based on those risks. So that's what Innovative Weather does. But what the program does is a lot more. Um, it does the kinds of things that you expect it to do for students in particular in an experiential learning setting. They learn about problem solving, particularly in non-traditional settings, real world settings. 
They learn how to communicate all this complicated information to sophisticated but non-technical users and to do that in a variety of forms. But there are other elements that also are developed, which I had not thought of initially in building this program. There's mentorship that the students learn, mentoring each other, peer mentorship. There's leadership, people taking charge of an operation. They see something that needs fixing, they fix it. There's accountability. The decisions that they're, they're helping our clients to make, tens of thousands of dollars can be on the line for a single forecast. So they're accountable for that, and they know that. And so yes, sometimes they fail. But if they're doing things properly, they learn from that. They're able to weather the subsequent storms. Our clients understand that there is uncertainty involved. And they learn a lot about themselves in the process, things that they can take with them wherever they go. And so it, we like to talk to our students to get their own input in terms of what they learned from the program. And they name a lot of the things that you might expect. For example, competitiveness in the job market. There can be as many as 1,000 applicants for a single forecast position in the National Weather Service. Our students have been known to get those positions, partly because of this experience. Uh, they talk about experiential learning outside of the classroom, the kinds of things that you can't do just sitting down at a desk. Uh, these are important because students end up doing things that aren't necessarily what the training develops them for. And they can take that with them. For example, I'd say about half of our students who go through this program end up staying as professional weather forecasters. That leaves another half that go somewhere else. About 25% of them go on to further research and education, and another quarter completely leave the field. So where do they go? Well, I was talking to one of our graduates, and she participated in, in research in the traditional classroom setting and also in innovative weather. She is now a, an analyst for an insurance company doing risk analysis. And she says that all of the things she learned and all of these different elements were really important to the work that she does now. So these are the lessons that you can bring from something like this that are not necessarily what you had in mind when you were training students. They also learn that they can be part of something much bigger than themselves, contributing to a larger thing, contributing to the community. That's an important lesson that I think a lot of, uh, we've lost a lot of opportunity for people to understand that in today's world. And it's something that our students really find to be important. Um, the idea of accountability. You'll sometimes hear people say something like, failure is not an option. Well, let's get real for a second here. This is weather forecasting. <laughs> failure is inevitable. What's important is that they know how to manage the failure, and in particular, manage the uncertainty that sometimes comes with subsequent failure, and communicate that in a useful way to our clients. What, and to give you a, a concrete example of that, there are a couple different kinds of weather situations. Some can be very high impact, but also the outcome is pretty clear. And then we can communicate that to our client, and they can take protective measures to account for that. So that's pretty straightforward. But many others are not so straightforward. They may also be high impact, but there's a whole range of possible outcomes. So we have to communicate possibility as well as probability to those clients, and to do it in a reliable way so that we're not just crying wolf all the time, they know when we say that, we mean it. That there's a range of outcomes and they have to be able to hedge their bets to protect against that. That has tremendous value. Finally, a point that I wanted to make about this is life throws you some curves. A few months after I founded Innovative Weather and we're still very much in the process of building up this fledgling operation, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer so I could have quit at that point. I could have said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't have time for this. I don't have the energy. But I said, no, I'm going to keep building this. There are other people who are depending on me to make this happen, because without me, it was not going to happen. Um, and that's why, for me, it's particularly rewarding to see our students understand the concept of legacy, of paying it forward. They understand that it's not just for their benefit, but it's also for the benefit of the students who are going to follow them, so that this program can continue to exist after they leave. 
And so as I was thinking about a lot of these questions in preparation for this talk, I wondered how generalizable is this concept? We're working in a very specific field, a very specific domain of weather. What about other STEM fields? What about engineering, for example? What about the professions or the humanities? Is it possible to replicate a model in some way that, that resembles this? Not in any of the details, that would be very different, and experts in those domains would have to be able to say whether or not that would work. My answer to that is yes, it will work. You have to figure out the details, but you can make it work. And what my challenge to those people is, is to think about what I was told about the reasons why I shouldn't, couldn't, and wouldn't, and say, yes, I can, and yes, I will, and just go ahead and do it. Thank you. <laughs>